Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. So this morning, I was requested to discuss cardiac arrest in a pregnant patient. And quite a depressing topic, I think, for the first agenda of this convention. As you can see, quite a tall order, but I will try to give a practical approach on this topic. Most especially, I know personally of the situation and where many are listening today have been in, where it's just you and the pregnant patient in the middle of the night in a remote part of the hospital. So, I have nothing to disclose. <clears throat> so let's go into the meat of the matter and take this quite extensive topic one step at a, at a time. Let's start with the first five minutes of maternal cardiac arrest. So as an overview, the first five minutes of maternal cardiac arrest involves the same resuscitation prioritization as a non-pregnant patient. As you will see as we go through this lecture, that much of the guidelines of the American Heart Association is the same for a pregnant patient as with a non-pregnant. So it prioritizes C, circulation foremost, followed by A, airway, then breathing, defibrillation, and at the fourth minute, Decision for E, extraction of the fetus. So E, extraction, is the decision point in failed maternal resuscitation with the goal of delivery of the fetus by the fifth minute via perimortem cesarean section due to failure of return of spontaneous circulation. So outcome is largely dependent on the anesthesiologist's prompt decision making with the primary focus of mother's survival throughout resuscitation. So let's put in mind the first five minutes of resuscitation and remind ourselves of the physiologic changes associated with pregnancy and the factors that would make maternal resuscitation successful. Bear in mind the hematologic, the cardiac, pulmonary, airway, GI changes leading to drastic alterations in maternal physiology. And if you fail to acknowledge these changes, it can hinder successful resuscitation. But I will not go into this in detail, and I will only discuss the more important physiologic changes to consider in the cardiac arrest of a pregnant patient. So first is aortocaval compression, prioritizing C circulation. We must consider this obstacle in effective resuscitation. In non-pregnant patients, chest compressions can achieve about 30% of normal cardiac output. But with aortocaval compression, the cardiac output drops to around 10%. So you must get this obstruction out of the way. So pull the uterus in a scooping motion towards the patient's left side. Hence, pulling is better than pushing. And the maneuver is lifting up the uterus and displacing it to the left side of the patient. Previously, tilting was recommended using a wedge for 30 degrees, but this is no longer recommended unless the patient is on a dedicated tilting table. So when do you start doing this? What defines a gravid uterus with the potential to cause aortocaval compression? So several factors determine the weight of the gravid uterus, the weight of the uterus, the number of fetuses, the weight of the fetus, the weight of the fluid of the mother. So a study found that maternal aortocaval compression can occur for singleton pregnancy starting at greater than 20 weeks age of gestation. As a general rule, the uterus reaches the level of the umbilicus at 20 weeks age of gestation and grows at a rate of approximately 1 cm in length for every week of gestation thereafter. So to have a rough estimate, one finger breadth is roughly 2 cm, so a uterus extending 4 finger breadths is 8 cm. Add to that the 20 weeks at the level of the umbilicus and that would represent a gestation of 28 weeks. Despite this, once the uterus is palpated above the umbilicus, despite uncertainty of the age of gestation, left uterine displacement should be done throughout maternal resuscitation, and one member of the resuscitation team is tasked solely for this. 
So now that we understand aortic caval compression and how to minimize this, let me emphasize the importance of chest compression. So chest compression recommendations for the pregnant patient are the same as the most current recommendations. So that's at least 100 per minute with compression ventilation of 30 is to 2 without an advanced airway or if, or if with already an advanced airway, one breath every 6 seconds or 10 breaths to 12 breaths per minute. And as with all adult resuscitations, high quality chest compressions. And the patient must be supine on a hard surface and the rescuer's hands must be placed correctly. So there's no scientific evidence to support the changing the recommendation for hand placement for pregnant patients. More importantly, resuscitation should occur at the site of arrest. Do not transport the patient. And moving forward, if you need to do perimortem cesarean section, do not transport the patient. Next, A airway. And because endotracheal intubation is frequently more difficult in our pregnant patients, we want to minimize the disruption in chest compressions. So any intubation attempt should be undertaken by an experienced laryngoscopist with no more than two attempts at either direct or video laryngoscopy. If there's failure at the second attempt, a supraglottic airway with an esophageal drain is placed and subsequently exchanged to a definitive airway once with ROSC. So in, in, if intubation is successful, don't forget to use a smaller endotracheal tube because of the likelihood of edema. And following intubation, ventilation should be set at 10 to 12 per minute, taking care to avoid hyperinflation. So if oxygenation and bag mask ventilation are not successful or the use of a supraglottic device in mask ventilation is impossible, a cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate situation has occurred, and after two failed attempts at laryngoscopy and two failed attempts at supraglottic airway device placement or ineffective ventilation throughout has occurred, we can turn to the Difficult Airway Society guidelines and declare cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate, and call for help to establish an emergency invasive airway access or a front of neck access that we can place. So pregnant women, those and those who are immediately postpartum are at an increased risk for regurgitation and aspiration. But chest compressions, oxygenation, and relief of aortic caval compression is our priority more than the techniques to limit the risk of regurgitation. So the use of cricoid pressure is not recommended during resuscitation. It may prevent aspiration, but it can impede ventilation and laryngoscopy. So, in the event of regurgitation before intubation, use suction to remove gastric contents from the oropharynx during the ongoing chest compressions. So, con continuous capnography should be used, if available, to assess correct placement of the endotracheal tube. And this can also aid in the quality of your chest compressions and suggest return of spontaneous, uh, return of spontaneous circulation, um, with, which will show rising of your entitled partial pressure of more than 10, or it's sustained above 10 with uh, ROSC or with effective chest compressions. So general considerations for the airway in COVID-19 in our new normal, don't be overachievers. Target O2 SATs, 88 to 95%. Do rapid sequence induction using the appropriate medications for your patient. Stop chest compressions during intubation and limit this to 10 seconds. In cases of difficult intubation or ventilation, you may use bag mask bag valve mass ventilation with a jaw thrust maneuver to ensure a tight seal or place an LMA and use the lowest positive pressures to target volumes of 4 up to 6 ml per kilo of ideal body weight. So once an advanced airway is placed, avoid ambu bagging and during ongoing chest compressions, if you have a ventilator or an anesthesia machine, you may shift to SIMV mode and use the rule of tens. So it's a backup rate of 10, a pressure support of 10, a flow trigger of 10, and then a peep of 0. 
So early defibrillation should be provided when appropriate and modifications in shock energy and the algorithm is the same. So the recommended defibrillation protocol should be used in the pregnant patient as in the non-pregnant. And defibrillation at the biphasic shock of 120 to 200 joules with subsequent escalations of energy output if the first shock is not effective. Compression should be resumed immediately after delivery of the shock. And you should not withhold defibrillation due to concerns for fetal safety. And there's only a minimal amount of energy that's transferred to the fetus and it's safe to defibrillate a pregnant patient in any stage of pregnancy. So anterior lateral defibrillator pad placement is recommended as a reasonable default. Don't forget to put the lateral paddle under the breast tissue in the pregnant patient. So. Let's summarize the four, first four minutes. So patient is unresponsive with no breathing or abnormal breathing and you call for help to activate the emergency response system and ask for four, at least four people in the team. You, the anesthesiologist, as team captain and airway specialist, the second team member to give compressions, another to provide left uterine displacement, another to provide the medications. Check for pulse. If no pulse, start chest compressions and document the time. Simultaneously perform appropriate airway management, continue left uterine displacement, and apply AED if available and provide defibrillation and the appropriate medications. So in the setting of cardiac arrest, no medication should be withheld. And although physiologic changes in pregnancy may affect the pharmacology of medications, there's no scientific evidence to guide a change in the current recommendations. So therefore, the usual drugs and doses are recommended during maternal cardiac arrest as stated in this table. In the setting of preeclampsia, magnesium toxicity should be considered, discontinue magnesium and administer calcium gluconate or calcium chloride as noted here. And in patients with suspected local anesthetic systemic toxicity, the recommended dosing of medications is as noted. So we summarize the first four minutes, but the spite quality resuscitation. Our patient still remains pulseless with no return of spontaneous circulation. So it's at the fourth minute, and this is the turning point to prepare for perimortem cesarean section. So the four minute rule was based on the assumptions derived from a landmark case series by Katz and colleagues. And it led them to conclude that perimortem CS within the first four minutes of maternal arrest could improve neonatal outcomes. So this time interval was also chosen to minimize the risk of neurologic damage to both the mother and fetus, which begins to develop at the fourth to sixth minute of anoxic cardiac arrest if there's no ROSC. So the purpose of timely perimortem delivery is twofold. The first is to facilitate resuscitation. So if the cardiac output has not been effectively established, despite relieving your aortocaval compression, emptying the uterus significantly Im improves your resuscitative efforts. And second, and of critical importance, is early delivery of the baby. And this is accomplished to decrease the risk of permanent neurologic damage from anoxia. So there are situations where the rescue team is not required to wait the four minutes for resuscitation in perimortem cesarean section. And the decision for early perimortem cesarean section is in cases with non-survival injury in which the maternal prognosis is grave, such as in severe trauma, or in situations of an unwitnessed cardiac arrest in which there's an expected prolonged period of pulselessness. So this four-minute rule need not apply to all cases. So how about the outcome of the fetus and the mother? So outcome for both the fetus, as stated here, and the mother looks quite favorable. 
So because of the high likelihood of delivering a depressed neonate after maternal arrest, the team attending delivery must anticipate and be prepared for an advanced resusc resuscitation. So with at least one member of the team skilled in emergency neonatal intubation and be prepared for resuscitation of the neonate. So in the ideal setting, after the first four responders in the first four minutes, three teams arrive to admit the first responders. So the second team is the obstetric team for perimortem CS and then a neonatal team to attend to the neonate. But then as an anesthesiologist, the coordination and combined teams will initially be you until help arrives. So be prepared to resuscitate both the mother and the fetus. So due to hypoxia, the uterus on ROSC will inevitably be atonic and will bleed. So consider giving the following uterotonics as stated, and also the obese favorite, tranexamic acid. And then for persistent uterine bleeding, consider suggesting to your surgeon these non-pharmacologic measures. So all throughout resuscitation, as the team captain, you're always considering the reversible and irreversible causes of cardiac arrest during resuscitation and as team captain. So similar to the recommendations for the non-pregnant, an understanding of the diagnosis and treating the underlying causes of those aggravating factors of cardiac arrest is fundamental. So remember your five H's and five T's throughout resuscitation, and then. In addition, the following causes could determine the cause for cardiac arrest in the mnemonic of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So in the setting of the new normal where our PPEs preclude us from performing a complete physical examination, bedside ultrasound has become a skill of increasing importance in aiding us with the causes for these critical events. So cardiac causes can be seen and also pulmonary problems. So a short note on ECMO for this population, given that the population of patients is comprised of a young group with large reversible etiologies of arrest. So use of ECMO should be considered if it's available in your hospital. Um, despite the lack of evidence in uh, parturients, it's limited, but it can be recommended for use in this group of patients. So after all your efforts, thankfully, the ROSC was your gain for both your patients, mother and neonate. So the mother should immediately be transferred to the ICU if possible. So even if with all your efforts, it's successful and you have ROSC, the effect of post-arrest brain injury limits the positive outcome for cardiac arrest. So one beneficial intervention has been mild post-arrest induced hypothermia. So pregnancy is no longer an absolute contraindication to targeted temperature management or targeted hypothermia. So given the lack of data on pregnant patients, the use of um, targeted temperature management post-resuscitation is made on an individual basis after cardiac arrest in a comatose pregnant patients. So here I will discuss briefly the 2021 guidelines by the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine for post-resuscitation care. So basically, these are your targets after ROSC in the ICU. So targets include a constant temperature for a duration of 12 up to 24 hours at 32 to 36 degrees Celsius, of course with a caveat of increased risk of bleeding for lower temperature targets. Absolutely avoid temperatures greater than 37.8 degrees after your targeted temperature time. Sedation is used to stop shivering, diagnose and control seizures, avoid hypotension with a MAP goal of greater than 65 millimeters mercury and a normal or decreasing goal of serum lactic acid, use pressors or inotropes or if needed, 
maintain normoxia at an oxygen saturation of 94 to 98% at the ICU or an arterial partial pressure of oxygen at a higher target of 75 to 100. So avoid hypoxemia and avoid hyperoxemia. Target an arterial partial pressure of uh, 35 to 45 millimeters mercury. Once cleared for feeding, target feeding using the gut first, using your NGT, before deciding on total parenteral nutrition. Target normal glycemia with a blood glucose target of 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter and a urine output of 0.5 ml per kilo of actual body weight. So if you know the cause, determine the etiology and continue treating the etiology. So after the 12 to 24 hour period of therapeutic hypothermia, absolutely avoid temperatures greater than 37.8 degrees Celsius until you are ready for neurologic prognostication. So neurologic prognostication is usually done after completion of your therapeutic hypothermia and factors such as sedation are excluded. So that's roughly 72 hours after return of spontaneous uh, circulation. So neurologic assessment is done using specific techniques to assess for neurologic recovery or hopefully not brain death. And hopefully with the assistance of a neurologist, the outcome after all your efforts is a good one for both your mother and the fetus. So in summary, cardiac arrest in the pregnant patient involves prompt decision making with the goal of maternal resuscitation. Take into consideration maternal physiology and overall the AHA guidelines are the same as the non-pregnant, adhering to the AHA guidelines of circulation, airway, breathing, defibrillation, and extraction with no adjustment needed for medications or defibrillation. And starting at the fourth minute of failed resuscitation, prepare for perimortem cesarean section with the goal of delivery within the fifth minute. And consider therapeutic hypothermia to improve neurologic recovery post-arrest. Thank you.